All right, well, as folks are filing in, let's open our Bibles uh, this evening, if we could, to the book of Acts. Uh, chapter 8 and verse 26. Um, we're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse look at the book of Acts, and uh, we are in um, a chapter where the focus is on Philip. Philip is the second deacon that was selected in the church. Uh, the first deacon was Stephen, and we saw his story play out in Acts 7, and now Acts 8 is really focused on deacon number 2, Philip. And you can take Philip's ministry and you can divide it into two here in chapter 8. You can see his ministry in Samaria, verses 5 through 25, which we finished um, last time. And then the geography changes and his ministry continues into Judea. Uh, verse 26 through the end of the chapter. So Philip has been um, up there in Samaria in the north, the circle in the north. And now he is um, moving. Well, look at this. I'm still learning the technology. I wanted to draw an arrow that went down like that, but maybe... Uh, it's kind of a scary thing if I sit up here and start pushing buttons because I know something's going to go wrong. Let's see if this works. Oh, look at this. Look at that. You guys like my arrow? I worked, I worked all week on my arrow. I hope you're proud of that, as I am. I didn't do very good in art in school. So they always could see I wasn't really up to par, so they kind of put me off to the side and... Let me do my independent work, you know. <laughs> so he's in Samaria up north, and he travels down um, south to Judea. And look at that, disappears. That's cool. And so it's at this point that he takes on this ministry in, uh, in Judea. And this is where he meets the Ethiopian eunuch, which is going to be a key uh, point, a key factor, if you will, in the spread of the gospel into Africa. So Luke is the author of the book of Acts, the human author. Of course, we know the Holy Spirit is the author of Acts. Uh, records this because Luke is interested in showing the birth and growth of the church. So how did the gospel ever make its way into Ethiopia? And you get an explanation of this through Philip's ministry in Judea. So taking that second half of the book of Acts, chapter 8, there's an outline that we can use to try to uh, understand what's happening here in verses 26 through 40. But the first thing you see here is that the angel uh, directs Philip. And look at verse 26. It says, but an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. And then Luke puts in parenthesis, um, this is a desert road. So it's here Philip gets a brand new commission. He is to head from Samaria down south to a road. And the road connects those two areas um, that I've got circled there, Jerusalem and Gaza. <clears throat> and the reason um, the angel directs Philip to standing there is this is the road uh, from Gaza that the Ethiopian eunuch is going to be traveling on. Philip doesn't know that, by the way but he doesn't need to know it because the Holy Spirit knows exactly what's happening. 
So basically, what this road does um, that connects Jerusalem to Gaza is it's part of something called the Via Maris, which basically means way of the sea. It's sort of a a well-known trade route, a well-known traveling route um, in biblical times. And the big picture is it connects uh, Egypt there in the southwest. You see I've got it circled. It connects Egypt to Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is there in the east, uh, basically modern-day Iraq. So it connects, if you can think of a map with modern nations on it, modern-day Egypt to modern-day Iraq. And so, you know, it's one of those roads that was traveled, or well-traveled, I should say, um, in ancient times. It was a trading route, and it kind of went through... Uh, the coastal area of the land of Israel. And it just so happens that the Ethiopian eunuch is going to be traveling on this particular road. And that's why the angel directs Philip to leave Samaria and go position himself on this particular road. You'll notice that Luke seems to know the geography very well. And this is one of those hints that this had to have been written by someone familiar with the geography and the topography, because he puts in parenthesis there, this is a desert road. And that basically fits everything we know of the geography of the time. Dr. Toussaint, in his commentary on the book of Acts, writes... Though Luke gave no record of God's commanding Philip to preach to the Samaritans, see, when Philip went to Samaria, there's no record that he was commanded by God to go. I mean, we can presuppose he was commanded by God to go, but Luke doesn't record that. But here Luke makes particular uh, reference to the fact that Philip went where he went because he was directed by God through an angel. And it shows you how much God loves people. God loves people. God wants to see people saved. God wants to see people in in heaven with him. And God is the one that knows that the Ethiopian eunuch is going to be traveling on this road at this time. And so he's positioning his deacon, Philip, for maximum impact. And you can kind of look at your life the same way. You know, your life, our lives are not about us. (laughs) I know that's, that's a tough one to get over for Americans, right? We think it's all about us. But the truth of the matter is there's all kinds of people around you that God wants to reach. And you happen to be the carrier of the gospel. You know, so you're in the job that you're in or you live in the neighborhood that you're, you live in. You have contact with the people that you have contact with. Because God knows a lot of things about what's going on all around you that you might not even be aware of. And he's positioning you for the right time and the right circumstances with the right message. And that's what God is doing with this obedient deacon named Philip. So concerning this desert road, Dr. Toussaint says, though Luke gave no record of God's commanding Philip to preach to the Samaritans, God did sovereignly direct Philip toward Gaza. And yes, Gaza is the exact same Gaza you're hearing about in the news. You know, the Gaza Strip, which the Israelis in 2004 handed over to the citizens of Gaza And as you know, they had one and only one election there. They voted in Hamas in 2005. And the Gaza Strip in the southwestern portion of the land of Israel, which at one time when the Israelis handed it over, was a beautiful beach area, natural resources, botanical gardens, and when Hamas got control of that area that the Israelis relinquished. And keep that in mind when the news keeps telling you Israel is the oppressor. If, they're, if Israel's the oppressor, they're doing a lousy job <laughs> of oppressing because oppressors don't hand over territory to people. 
So they handed that territory over, Hamas took, o- took it over, and ever since then it's been turned into a terrorist camp to launch attacks into the land of Israel. The most significant is what just happened October the 7th. That, that all came from the Gaza Strip. And so yes, that's the exact same Gaza that we're reading about here. Toussaint continues and he says the highway is referred to as the desert road. The expression may refer to a desert road or a desert city. Ancient Gaza was destroyed in 93 BC and the city was rebuilt nearer the Mediterranean in 57 BC. The old city was called Desert Gaza. The Greek for the angel's command can be translated as follows. Arise and go to uh, to the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem, this is desert. This is a reference to the road in Acts 8, verse 36, which may imply that the road, not the city, was in a deserted area. So the fact that Luke makes reference to the fact that it's a a desert road, it, it fits the geography and the topography of the time. And notice what the angel told Philip to do. Get up, go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem. That's a perfect description of the geography and the topography of Jerusalem. Because when you travel to Israel and you go to Jerusalem, you're going upward. And when you're leaving Jerusalem, you're coming downward. That's why in your Bible, I think it's around Psalm 120, it starts. I may not have the numbers exactly right, but there's a a section in your Bible called the Psalms of Ascent because the Israelis were required to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the various feast days. And they're called Psalms of Ascent because those were the psalms that were sung or were chanted by the Israelis as they were making their way up to Jerusalem. So when you go to Israel, and I say when, not if, because you're going to get there one way or the other, you're going to be there for a thousand years in the Millennial Kingdom, so you might as well go over now and get the lay of the land. Um, If you're on a good tour group and the guide is pretty competent um, as you're making your way towards Jerusalem on the bus, you know, he'll have you or the group kind of sing or chant some of these uh, psalms of ascent. So that's the significance of it talking about a road that descends from Jerusalem. So the reference to the desert road, the the reference to coming down from Jerusalem. I mean, it's kind of obvious that contrary to what liberals say, somebody wrote this centuries or you know, a long time later that didn't know anything about the geography of Israel. Obviously, that doesn't make sense because this reads like someone who either was Jewish or knew the Jewish people very well and understood the geography and the topography of the, of the time period. And then you go to verse 27, where Philip, after the angel tells him to leave Samaria, he obeys. And look at verse 27. It says, so he, that's Philip, got up and he went. (laughs) So he did what he was told. Now, I don't think that was easy for Philip to do that. Because in Samaria, through his evangelistic activity, he was in the middle of a spiritual revival. I mean, there was something going on in Samaria that hadn't gone on in 700 years where God was bringing the Jewish believers and the Samaritan believers together into one new man called the body of Christ. We talked a little bit about that when we were in that earlier section in Acts chapter 8. And, you know, if you're Philip, you might want to say, well, Lord, why should I leave? I mean, this is great what you're doing here. I mean, there's a revival going on. And actually, Lord, you use me to start the revival. So I ain't going anywhere. (laughs) Well, the fact that Philip did what he was told 
pressed Philip into a plan greater than a revival in Samaria. Because what's going to happen is not only is there going to be a revival in Samaria through the hands of Philip, but now the gospel is going to go into Ethiopia or Africa. And so God knew what was going to happen. And he didn't give Philip the end game. He didn't say, okay, when you stand on this road, you're going to meet the Ethiopian eunuch, you're going to lead him to Christ, and he's going to go back to Ethiopia, and he's going to bring the gospel into Ethiopia. The, the angel that's instructing Philip gave him no information. He just told him to do what he was told, and Philip did it. And so when God directs you certain ways, um, don't expect some big explanation on the front end. Because if he gave you a great big explanation on the front end of what he was going to do, um, there wouldn't be any real incentive to walk by faith. It God wants us to walk by faith. Uh, without faith, Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, it's impossible to please God. And the Holy Spirit knew what was going to happen, and he knew of a greater impact that Philip would have even beyond initiating a revival in Samaria, the Holy Spirit knew that the gospel was going to get to that circle at the bottom of the screen there, uh, Ethiopia. And by the way, the Holy Spirit is going to do the exact same thing in Acts 16, verses 6 through 10. Because it's going to be at that point that Paul the Apostle, I think this is missionary journey number two, is going to be told by the Holy Spirit, do not go into Asia. Uh, do not go into that region. Well, I've got a pen so I can circle it, can't I? That region which is up here. Don't go there. Oh, and also, don't go down here. Don't go down here either. And Paul was probably saying to himself, boy, there's a bunch of unreached people groups there. I want to go up north, and I want to go down south. But you see, the Holy Spirit knows what he's doing because he kept Paul mo moving. He got to Troas, which is here, and he saw the vision of the Macedonian man which said, come over and help us. And that's how the gospel got into Europe. And if Paul had gotten sidetracked into going up north or going down south, the gospel wouldn't have ever penetrated, well, maybe it would have at some point in God's providence, but at least not through Paul, the gospel would have never gotten into Europe. And if Paul had sat there and second-guessed God, the results that God wanted to bring forth evangelistically would have been limited. Because God is smart enough to know that the gospel is going to get up here at some point. There's a reference to it in 1 Peter chapter 1. The gospel made it up into that area without Paul. And the gospel is going to get down here as well. And it's going to happen in Acts 19. What I'm teaching you now is from Acts 16. And the Holy Spirit never gave Paul the explanation that he was looking for. Maybe he was looking for it, maybe he wasn't. He just said, keep moving, I know what I'm doing. And because Paul did what he was told, the gospel made it into Europe, and up north got evangelized, and down south got evangelized. I mean, this whole thing is recorded in Acts 16, 6 through 10. It says they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Don't go to Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And by passing by Mysia, they came to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. 
So Paul walks by faith and does exactly what the Lord directs him to do, and there's evangelistic progress. The same exact thing is happening here with Philip, who could have rebelled and stayed in Samaria, but because he didn't, and he walked by faith and did exactly what the angel told him, there was a far greater evangelistic impact than Philip could have ever dreamed of. Now I've got to erase all my little lines here. My kindergarten teacher, Miss Ruben, Ruben Khan was her name. She would be so proud. And so you come to verses, oh, by the way, uh, one quick verse on all of this. It's Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. Isaiah says concerning God, my thoughts are not your thoughts. <laughs> nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So we really put ourselves into a danger, dangerous predicament when we try to out-strategize God. God, don't do it that way. Let me stay in Samaria. I'm, I'm better use here. No, I want you to do exactly what I told you to do. I want you to stand on this road on the connecting the Via Maris because I know what I'm doing. And so it's just a matter of acquiescing to what he wants us to do and to walk by faith. Then you come down to verses 27b through 28 and there you get a description of this Ethiopian eunuch who is traveling along the road that Philip didn't know anything about this. It says in verse 27, so he got up and went and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace. Now Candace, it's, it's kind of tempting to look at that and say, well, that's the queen's name, but that's more of a title like Caesar. There was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. And this, and he, that's the Ethiopian eunuch, had come to Jerusalem to worship. Verse 28. And he was returning and sitting in this chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. So who is this Ethiopian eunuch? This Ethiopian eunuch is what we would call a proselyte. A proselyte is basically somebody that was non-Jewish that wanted, kind of like Ruth in the book of Ruth, where Ruth said to Naomi, remember Ruth was from Moab, uh, which is east of the um, Jordan River, modern day Jordan basically. She was not an Israeli, she was not Hebrew, but she wanted to walk with the God of Yahweh, so she said to her mother-in-law, Naomi, my God will be your God, your God will be my God, your people will be my people. And so a proselyte is someone who was non-Jewish, basically a Gentile, who wanted to follow the ways of the God of Israel. And so they, in essence, converted to Judaism. And that's essentially what this Ethiopian eunuch was. That's why he's on his way back on the Via Maris, stopped at Jerusalem to worship. That's why he's reading Hebrew scripture, the prophet Isaiah. And as a eunuch, he was not even a full-fledged proselyte. He was sort of a half-proselyte. Because Deuteronomy 23 and verse 1 says of eunuchs, it says, no one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off, shall enter the assembly of the Lord. So you're dealing with someone who's a very sincere seeker of God, doesn't really understand the fullness of God. He sort of has the status of a proselyte, but he is not a full proselyte. So Arnold Fruchtenbaum gives a really good description here of this Ethiopian eunuch. He says the text states that he was a eunuch. Eunuchs were often employed by oriental rulers in positions of high office. They were also male servants of female dignitaries. 
but only placed in such positions after having been castrated. I mean, so why would you have them, someone that wanted to serve in this capacity, castrated so they wouldn't impregnate, you know, the queen and all of the females? Politically, he was a highly influential. Uh, he was a highly influential official under Candace, because if you look at verse twenty-seven, it says he was in charge of all of her treasure. So he is somebody who is actually uh, influential in the Ethiopian circles. Politically, he was a highly influential official under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Candace, and there's the Greek name, was not a proper name, but the title of the queen of Ethiopia, much like the word Kaiser was the title of the king of Germany, and Tsar was the title of the king of Russia. Because the king of Ethiopia was considered to be a child of the sun and therefore a person too sacred to be involved with secular functions of the royal court, all such duties fell to the queen mother who had the title Candace. As a result, she was the real power behind the throne and Ethiopia was a de facto matriarchy. Now, the Holy Spirit never explained any of this to Philip. Because if this guy gets saved, given his position in the Ethiopian Empire, and given who the Ethiopian eunuch is connected to, suddenly, just like that, you're going to have the gospel at the highest places in Ethiopia. Philip, that's why I want you to leave Samaria and go stand on this road. I mean, Philip wasn't told any of this. He just has to walk by faith. It's, it's a lot like um, you're in a strange city, which I was just in, Milwaukee. I've never been to Milwaukee before, other than I used to follow some of the Milwaukee Bucks games back a long time ago, the Bob Lanier days and Marcus Johnson I know, T TMI, too much information. Um, so I know nothing about Milwaukee. I, w I, w I don't know my way around Milwaukee, but the guy who picked me up and took me to the conference knows where he's going. And when he's driving me, he doesn't say, okay, this is what's going to happen, and that's what's going to happen. I'm going to turn left at this signal. I'm going to turn right at this signal. Because it's information I don't really need to know. I mean, all I really have to do is trust the guy that's driving the car. If I trust his integrity and his character and his abilities, I don't have to have the whole driving script, you know, given to me in advance. And that's sort of how it is walking with the Lord. The Lord is not going to, in advance, lay out a map and tell you exactly what he's going to do. Because if he did it, A, we probably wouldn't believe it anyway. And B, it's just above our pay grade. I mean, his ways are higher than our ways, right? I mean, he's doing things in our lives that are so intellectually beyond us. And all he wants us to do is to walk by faith and be obedient. So that's why this is happening to Philip the deacon. The eunuch was in charge of her treasure, which means he held one of the highest government positions. His influence in Ethiopia would have been um, considerable. Now, this is analogous to or very similar to Paul's interest in the Praetorian Guard in the book of Philippians, where he had his prison ministry. In the book of Philippians, which is the book of joy, he spends chapter 1 explaining that the Christian is never a prisoner of his circumstances. And one of the illustrations that he uses is, hey, I'm in prison and I'm chained to this guard. But the truth of the matter is, I'm not chained to the guard, the guard is chained to me. <laughs> he completely reverses um, the circumstances. I mean, I mean, if I were chained to a guard in a prison, I would just be probably in my natural self just feeling sorry for myself. Oh, Lord, why have you put me through this? 
But Paul the Apostle in that circumstance turns the whole thing around and says, I'm not chained to him, he's chained to me. And incidentally, he's a member of the Praetorian Guard, which is Caesar's elite guard. So if this guy gets saved and he's got nowhere to go, right, because he's chained to me, talk about a captive audience. If this guy gets saved, think of how the gospel is going to spread in the upper echelons of the Roman Empire. So that's why Paul makes reference to the Praetorian Guard in Philippians 1.13. He says, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. See, the, the humanistic way of thinking is, Lord, I, I would be much more useful to you if I was free as a bird and traveling about and evangelizing. But God says my ways are higher than yours. You're actually chained to a Praetorian elite guard. And you're not chained to him as much as he's chained to you, and he's got nowhere to go. So keep proclaiming the gospel to him around the clock. And as he gets saved, the whole gospel is going to spread into the upper echelons of Rome. So that's a kind of a, a equivalent thing of what's happening here with, um, with Philip. And then you come down to verse 29, and now the Holy Spirit starts speaking to Philip. See, first it was an angel that spoke to him, verse 26. Uh, now it's the Holy Spirit. Oh, and incidentally, even before we move to verse uh, 29, what was the Ethiopian eunuch reading? Isaiah. Why was he reading Isaiah? Because he was involved in a spiritual pilgrimage as a proselyte, not a full proselyte, to Jerusalem, traveling near that area on the Via Maris Highway. That's why he's reading Isaiah. And he's probably leaving Jerusalem and going back to Ethiopia. So he had a spiritual experience of some kind in Jerusalem, and he's reading the most well-known prophet in Hebrew Bible, which is Isaiah. And by the way, we're going to find out in a minute that it just so happened. What a coincidence. He's not reading any section of Isaiah, any old section. He's reading Isaiah 53, which happens to be a prophecy written 700 years in advance about who? Jesus Christ. So you see how the Lord set this whole thing up. And Philip was never told on the front end any of these things. He was just told to walk by faith. So you go down to verse 29, and now it's not just an angel talking to Philip. It's the Holy Spirit. It says, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join his chariot. So notice, uh, first of all, God uses multiple means of communication. First, he's speaking through an angel, verse 26, to Philip. But then he uses the different means of God, the Holy Spirit, the eternally existent third member of the Trinity is now speaking to Philip, and he's telling Philip to do the exact same thing. That's the ancient principle of let a matter be confirmed by two to three witnesses. If God is leading you to do something, talk to somebody, go somewhere, I wouldn't go just on the basis of one witness. I would ask the Lord to confirm it through two to three witnesses. Because the Bible from cover to cover says by two to three witnesses let a matter be confirmed. So my wife, who's very beautiful as, as you guys know, as I know, would have uh, people come up to her when she was a missionary with a missions group. I'm not sure if they said it to her, but they said it to her peer group. And they, the men would say, well, God um, has told me that you're supposed to be my wife. Thus saith the Lord, God says you're to be my wife. Um, hmm, well, God hasn't really told me that. Can we, can we let this be confirmed a little bit? Because people will do this to you. They'll come up to you and they'll say, God told me to tell you X, do this. And you don't have to do anything. 
you say, well, let's let the Lord work this out and confirm it because there's an ancient principle in scripture, you know, let a matter be confirmed to two to three witnesses. I mean, if you're going to make a radical life change like that in marriage, for marriage, I guarantee you it's not just going to be a sing singular witness. It's going to be two to three, and in some cases, God is kind enough to give you, you multiple witnesses. So this time it's the Holy Spirit speaking to Philip, the eternally existent uh, third member of the Godhead. And basically, when you look at this in the original Greek, what, it's a directive, it's a command, and you can translate it as follows. Glue yourself to the chariot. I mean, go up there, sit with this guy, and it's almost like you're, you're gluing yourself to him. And for Philip to obey that involved courage because you're dealing here with a high government official. The Ethiopian eunuch, obviously given his position, had security detail. So you, you could think of a scenario where Philip could have lost his life for doing this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. A lot of the things that God is calling us to do is going to require some courage. It's not the easiest thing in the world following Jesus. And yet, when you fall into fear, you just have to understand that that fear didn't come from, from God. It came from the sin nature that doesn't want to walk by faith and generates excuses as to why you can't do what God has called you to do. But, you know, I had a youth pastor once that put it this way. He says, one plus God is a majority. All you need is the calling of God. And all of the other potential obstacles that we generate in our unbelieving minds, God will take care of. You know, what about consequence A? What about consequence B? What about consequence C? God says, don't worry about that. I just want you to walk by faith. This is why the Bible, as you know, 365 times says, do not fear. And you look at that number, 365, I mean, that's like one time for every day of the year. 365 days on the on our calendar. So every day you wake up and the Lord is telling you, don't be afraid. Walk by faith. Do what I tell you to do. Leave the results to me and do not fear. So Philip, fortunately here, did not acquiesce to, to fear. And so now Philip begins to witness to the Ethiopian eunuch. And you see here Philip's question the eunuch's answer, what the eunuch was reading, the eunuch's que follow-up question, and then Philip boldly from Isaiah 53 declares Jesus down in verse 35. But notice, first of all, the eunuch's question. Philip, excuse me, not the eunuch's question, Philip's question. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, probably because he was, you know, verbally saying it as he was reading. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? What an important question that is. Because there's a big difference between reading and comprehension. Those are two different things. Many read, but don't comprehend. Many hear, but do not listen. In other words, you can hear someone audibly talking, but listening is different where you're actually comprehending what they're saying. Many see or perceive, but do not fully understand. So Philip presupposes that just because you're reading this uh, doesn't mean you really understand what it's talking about. You might be going through kind of a ritual exercise. In fact, when you go to Israel, Jerusalem, and you go to the, 
Wailing Wall. Um, off to the side there, they have these sort of um, prayer books and scriptures that you can read. And you see all of these Jewish people, you know, going down to the Wailing Wall, doing their reading, putting the book up, putting it on its shelf, and leaving the Wailing Wall area. And as you sit there and observe these people, it's very obvious that they're going through a ritual that they really don't understand. It's like, okay, I did the religious thing, checked it off my list, put the book back in the shelf where it's supposed to be, and now I'll just go back to my normal life. But I, I got my religious checklist accomplished today. But it's obvious the people going through this ritual, and you can watch them do this all day long if you stay there long enough. That it's just a ritual without really any real understanding. It's very similar to the first 16 years of my life where I was raised Episcopalian. And the Episcopalians, I'm telling you, they, are, they move in the service. You're up, you're down, you're singing, you're turning in the hymn book to this, you're saying the Nicene Creed, you got the prayer bench out, you kneel down, you stand up again, you recite this, you recite that. And I'll be honest with you, I was an altar boy in the Episcopalian church. I had the whole thing memorized, the whole thing. And I didn't have the foggiest idea what it was about. It was a, just a ritual that I was going through because that's what our family did on a Sunday morning. So it wasn't until I got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit that I went back to that particular parish, went through the ritual, and finally the stuff that they were doing made sense spiritually because now I was saved. But I had no concept of what any of it was about, even though I had it down to a science. In fact, they actually gave me this giant cross uh, for perfect attendance and all of these kinds of things. I had all this stuff memorized. I didn't, have, I didn't know anything about the truth of the gospel. So I was um, reading, but not perceiving. I was hearing, but not listening. Um, and so that's kind of the situation that the Ethiopian eunuch is in. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9 actually talks about the Israelis doing this when they don't have a right relationship with the Lord. It says in Isaiah 6 verse 9, he said, Go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. So Philip's question, do you understand what you're reading, is like a very important question. And then the Ethiopian unit gives an answer. It's there in verse 31. And he said, uh, Acts 8 verse 31, well, how could I? <laughs> Unless someone guides me. I mean, how can I really understand it without a teacher? And he, that's the Ethiopian eunuch, invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So when I became the president of Chafer Seminary, you know, they asked me to kind of write um, a brochure kind of thing explaining uh, the significance of our school, why we exist. And this, this is the verse that I picked. I did a little exposition in written form on Acts 8, verse 31, where the Ethiopian eunuch asked Philip, how, ca how could I? Do you understand what you're reading? How could I unless someone guides me? So the purpose of Chafer Seminary is to raise up teachers and preachers that have the ability to guide people and explain to people what the Bible is actually saying. Because if that gift is not in operation in the body of Christ, what you're going to be left with is a whole bunch of rote ritual of people doing things but not really understanding what exactly it is they're doing. And that makes the gift of teaching such an important spiritual gift. 
This is why God put the gift of teaching in the body of Christ. It says in Romans 12, verse 7, concerning the various spiritual gifts, if service in his serving, or one who teaches in his teaching. Because if you don't have teachers that are equipped with the truth of God's word, what you're going to be left with in Christianity is what I was stuck with for the first 16 years of my life, ritualism without understanding. And this explains why the gift of pastor teacher, which only God can give, a school can't give this gift. A degree can't give this gift. The Holy Spirit gives the gift. But the school can come alongside and assist someone in growing in that gift. This is why God put the gift of pastor teacher in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4 verses 11 through 16 talks about it. It says, he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Now, Greek there is Granville Sharp rule, where you have the singular definite article, two nouns joined by a conjunction. Definite article followed by two nouns, and the two nouns are joined by a conjunction and I think it's Kai here. And when that happens in Greek, Granville Sharp, who, by the way, was an abolitionist. Interesting history. Oh, you Christians, you're in favor of slavery because the Bible says slaves be kind to their masters, be kind to their slaves. Um, people that say stuff like that don't, ha don't know anything about church history. Granville Sharp... <laughs> worked alongside William Wilberforce to abolish the slave trade in, from Parliament in Europe. Granville Sharp also happened to be a Greek scholar. And so Granville Sharp developed this grammatical rule that all first-year Greek students know. It's called the Granville Sharp Rule. The Granville Sharp Rule is when you have a definite article and two nouns joined by a conjunction, then the two nouns are equal. And just because you're a Greek scholar doesn't mean you don't care about cultural issues and the issue of slavery, which is an, an abomination of an institution. And so Granville Sharp, who developed this rule, worked with William Wilberforce to get rid of the slave trade. And while I'm on this subject, I think it's interesting that many nations of the earth still have slavery. And those happen to be nations of the earth that are primarily Islamic, where the gospel of Jesus Christ never penetrated. So everywhere Christianity goes, it destroys the institution of slavery because how can one man enslave another when we're both we're all made in God's image, regardless of skin pigmentation? So just remember that when you're hit with propaganda by people that's saying, oh, you, all you Christians are in favor of slavery because the Bible says slaves, you know, be obedient to their masters. Uh, nonsense. Uh, Granville Sharp's life demonstrates that. Okay, that was a rabbit trail. No extra, no extra charge for that. But Granville Sharp rule kicking in here says pastor teacher is equal. What this really says is he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastor teachers. There are pastors and then there are teachers. But there is a unique gift that God has put into the body of Christ called the gift of pastor-teacher. It's the ability to teach the Word of God in a way that people can understand it, that's applicable, understandable, so that the body of Christ can mature. And as we mature, we're not just going through rituals without understanding what we're doing. 
So this is the kind of thing that Philip is moving in here. Yes, he's a deacon, but he's bringing to this Ethiopian eunuch understanding. And that's what the gift of pastor teacher does. It's not to put a person on a pedestal. It's to help the body of Christ mature. Paul says he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastor teachers. Can you be a pastor without being a teacher? Yes. Can you be a teacher without being a pastor? Yes. But there's a special gift called pastor teacher. Well, why did God give that gift? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. In other words, when we understand what it is we're supposed to understand, we're not just hearers, but we're understanding things. We're not just going through rote ritualism. We're becoming equipped, and we're maturing. Well, what does maturity look like? Glad you asked. Until we attain to the unity of the faith. We're not involved in factionalism, fighting with each other, turf wars over things that are not spoken of clearly in Scripture. And we will have the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we will no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried away by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. It sounds like a modern description of Christianity today. Little children swept along by various fads, not acting as a unified man in the body of Christ. Well, what, what's the problem? You don't have an activation of the gift of pastor teacher. That's the problem. You don't have prepared people with the gift standing in the pulpit teach, teaching these things from the scripture. Uh, what you have is a bunch of Christians going to a religious service that's more of a pep rally than in a time of equipping. And that's what's happening in most churches. You, you go and you listen, it's a pep rally. You're excited. People are clapping. Nothing wrong with clapping and being excited, but are they being equipped because if they're not being equipped, they're, they're going to be neutralized in their lives. They can't be effective for God if you're not being equipped. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building of itself up in love. So you notice that everything started with the apostles and the prophets. The foundation of the church was laid through them, Ephesians 2 verse 20. And then God brought in the evangelists to lead other people to a saving knowledge of this foundation that has been established by the apostles. And then God dropped into the body of Christ the gift of pastor-teacher to help the converted mature and to grow. And so this is what Philip, in a slightly different sense, is helping this Ethiopian eunuch to do. Do you really understand what you're reading? So Philip asked the question, the eunuch gives the answer, verse 31, how, am I, how would I ever understand this unless someone guides me? And then you see the sovereignty of God there, verses uh, 32 and 33, because he just happened to be reading Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 8. What a coincidence. The Holy Spirit knew he would be reading that passage as he's returning from a religious pilgrimage as a proselyte, traveling on that particular road at that particular moment. And so, Philip, I'm not going to explain all this to you. Just go stand where you're supposed to stand because you're going to be the instrument 
that I'm going to use in these circumstances to get the gospel to Ethiopia. So you go down to verses 32 and 33, and you have a description of the section of Isaiah 53 that the Ethiopian eunuch happened to be reading. Now the passage of Scripture which uh, he, he was reading was this. This is Isaiah 53, 3 through 8. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers, shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generations, generation, excuse me, for his life is removed from the earth? So that's Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 8, which had been written. You date Isaiah about the 8th to the 7th century B.C., So this is something that had been written more than 700 years in advance, and it's a prophecy about Jesus, which by the time this is being written and read, Jesus had fulfilled this prophecy written 700 years in advance. That's what the Ethiopian eunuch is reading here. He was despised and forsaken, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, And like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and yet we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. That's what the Ethiopian eunuch is reading, which was written minimum 700 years in advance, a prophecy fulfilled in this generation that we're reading about here in the person of Jesus Christ. So God (laughs) has put everything into motion for this man to get saved so that the gospel can go to Africa. And the instrument that God used to do this is Philip. Now, what if Philip had stayed in Samaria? I don't want to do things your way, Lord. Are you saying, Andy, that the Ethiopian eunuch wouldn't have gotten saved? I'm not saying that at all. For this simple reason, God's work is going to get done. The only issue is, do you, do I receive the honor of being used by him? Because if if we're not going to cooperate... And there are a lot of Christians that just don't want to cooperate with God. There's a lot of churches that don't want to cooperate with God. There's a lot of elder boards that I know of that don't want to cooperate with God. Because walking with God and listening to Him and trying to follow His lead is taking us too far out of our comfort zone. So what happens is that God takes that kind of Christian or that kind of church and he just puts it on the shelf. They they didn't lose their salvation or something like that. They just missed out on being used of the Lord. They they missed out on the uniqueness and, and the neatness of being that pliable tool in the hands of the Creator. If church A won't cooperate, okay, I'll I'll get church B. You know, it's a lot like when my my daughter was very, very little. I know it's hard to imagine her little. But she would see me emptying the dishwasher. And believe it or not, that's my job in the home, emptying the dishwasher. I wake up every day and take dominion over the dishwasher. She would she would see me doing this and she would try to, to help. 
when she was so little, she would reach up and try to put the cups in and the dishes. And I would kind of watch her doing it. And she was sort of struggling because she was so little. And I would just say, you know, this is, this is taking too long. You know, it'd be much easier if I just did the whole thing myself. But then as a father, you think for a minute, well, if I just did the whole thing myself, I just cheated her out of the opportunity of contributing to the household and participating. So that is sort of how it is with God's work. God's work is going to get done. It's, it's no problem for God. The issue is who is he going to use? And if we cooperate with, with what he wants to do, suddenly we're blessed because we get the privilege of being used by the Lord. It, you know, it reminds me of the book of Esther, chapter 4, verse 14. I'm getting ready to land the plane here, don't worry. Because if I, I'm not even going to turn to Esther because that'll be another half hour. But it says in Esther, chapter 4, verse 14, um, I think it was uh, Mordecai speaking to Esther. You know, deliverance is going to come from another source. I mean, if, if you won't cooperate, Esther, deliverance is going to come through another source. God is going to get his work done. But who knows? Maybe you have been put into this position for such a time as this. So cooperate with what God wants to do and, and be used mightily by God. And don't think that if you don't cooperate, then somehow the work of God suffers. The work of God is going to get done. The gospel is going to go into Ethiopia. The issue is, who is God going to use? And in this particular case, he used uh, this man, Philip. So the Ethiopian eunuch is reading... And then the Ethiopian eunuch is going to ask a question. And then the Ethiopian eunuch is going to get saved. And then the Ethiopian eunuch is going to get baptized. And then Philip is going to get raptured. Not permanently. But he's going to be brought back down. And he's going to keep traveling up to Caesarea, preaching the gospel eventually settling there in terms of the rest of his life. So we'll pick up that story beginning in verse 34 next time. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the book of Acts and the things that it teaches us. We do pray, Lord, that we would not be an old wineskin. Jesus talked about the new wine can't be poured into the old wineskin because the old wineskin will break. I don't want to be, Lord, an old wineskin. I want to be that tool that you can use for the fresh wine. Make us like that here at Sugarland Bible Church, Lord. If you would be so kind, could you use us in the outworking of your great purposes? which we know are going to get done one way or the other. But we do ask that we would be the kind of people that you would reach down and use for your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.